to see him. I'm going to ask you to um, open your Bibles or your bulletins or to uh, cast your eyes upon the screens to one specific verse of scripture. Um, Minister Neil read for us um, verses 12 through 16, which allowed me to read verse 17. And so if you will read, if you will read aloud 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we will with one voice, one heart, um, one mind and spirit read verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. If you're there, say I'm there. Let's read it aloud. Therefore, if any man or anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Would you turn to a neighbor? Say, neighbor, God wants you to be a new and better you. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Ushers, allow worshipers in. Some of you who, Harry, follow me on Facebook are aware of the fact that on this past week, I can't remember whether it was Wednesday, but Gaddis, or Thursday, but one day uh, this past week, uh, some of you will remember that I posted a rather lengthy video in response to the president's decision regarding DACA right. and, um, and how I felt uh, this decision by our president would not only impact on the low end, now y'all stay with me, Sister Sandra, on the low end would impact close to a million young people. Uh, 800,000 is the, Felicia, the conservative number, uh, and, and you know that 800,000 is 200,000 less than a million. But, but then, Brother Penn, when you, when you add in, th th these are young people uh, anywhere from maybe 12 to about uh, 25, 30 years old, uh, you add in parents and siblings, that, that number could reach well to a million and a half people impacted adversely by the president's decision. Now, um, I, am, I, I am very cognizant of the fact that in this room, uh, Brother Watkins, in this room and watching me online, are both Democrats and Republicans. So I need to say that I am not making this statement out of political partisanship, but rather out of a sincere desire to be prophetic in my pastoral pronouncements. I need y'all to stay with me because, because it is the job of the preacher pastor to not only preach what people like to hear, but to also lift with courage what people need to hear. But, but in, in, in the saying of that, I, I, need to, I, need to, I need to nail down the fact that I am not saying it from a Democratic or Republican position. I, I really am seeking to say it from a biblical, theological, Christocentric perspective. All right, all right. And um, I, I, I will say this, though. 
that it, it is um, somewhat concerning, and, and I'll say another word, it is somewhat disconcerting that, that it seems to me that our current president, uh, number 45, is so bent on undoing everything by President 44. I, 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 I do not know if in the history of our republic some 240 plus years we have ever seen a man come to the presidency with an agenda of dismissing everything his predecessor has done before him as if to further legitimatize his accusation that he was an illegitimate president. I, I wrestle while seeking to respect the office. What is the motivation behind some of the decisions made by the current occupant of the Oval Office. And, and uh, but Greg Simmons, uh, I said in this rather lengthy video that, that I would hope that our president understands that the presidency matters, but also the words of the president matters. That, that, that you cannot, and, and can I say this, and I trust you will not be angry at me, and that is not only a word for our president, that is a word for every leader. But that's not just a word for every leader, that's a word for every person that words carry weight. And so you just cannot tweet at two in the morning, four in the morning, anything you want to tweet. You cannot just um, off the cuff say anything you want to say because that position that you occupy is not only the highest office that can be stowed, be bestowed upon you in our land, it sets you literally as the leader of the free world. And, and when you think of the words that have come from the lips of former presidents, we cannot help but pray that our current president will find some new verbiage. And, and it may be, and I'll move on, because I see y'all trying to sleep on me, and I'm preaching too good for you to go to sleep on me. It, 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 it may be that, that God works in mysterious ways. Uh, his wonders to perform. He plant, Grandma said he plants his feet. I wish I had old folk knew old song upon the sea and watch this and rides on every stone. It may be the late Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., Daddy King, you say uh, of God that God is the only one he knew who could hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. It may be, it may be that God is allowing Irma and Harvey and catastrophe to shake our president because have you noticed he ain't been tweeting much this week. <laughs> it, it may be, son, it may be that God who can cause all things to hold them to work together, not all things are good. Don't misquote Romans 8.28, but God is so much God, he can get in the middle of mess and make mess work for good. <laughs> for those who love him and are the call according to his purpose. I, I pray for our president. I know some of you don't, but you need to. He is our president. Uh, like Reagan was. Y'all 
Rockin' Choir, like, like, like Pop Bush was, yes, sir. Uh, like Woodrow Wilson was, like Rutherford B. Hayes was, y'all get quiet, like Andrew Johnson was, like Millard Fillmore was. We, we do not have the right to say he's not, he, we may not have voted for him, but he is our president. And Paul's words to Timothy that we ought to pray for those in authority. And, and one of my constant daily prayers for, for this gentleman is that God will get a hold of his mind and his mouth and, and cause him to rise up to the high level of this high office that he holds. I, I thought about, as I move now, I thought about what I said in that um, rather lengthy video around DACA uh, relative to the weight that words have, specifically from our president. But then I thought, Deacon Murray, of the weight that words have in the lexicon of the church. And are y'all still awake? And that, and that, there is... Okay, I'll put it this way. My, my friend and brother, Dr. Charles Booth, and we are praying for Dr. Booth. He is out of the pulpit for six weeks after surgery. We're praying for him and Mount Olivet. Um, um, Dr. Booth had a sermon years ago that we discussed when he was working on it called the Galilean Accent. And uh, when, when we were talking about this sermon, uh, Booth was telling me that his thesis, his premise was that there is an accent that belongs to Christians that marks our language different from the language of the world. So that, so that when we open our mouth, people ought to denote there's something different about us. Huh. It, it, it is, it is, you remember uh, on that night, that Thursday night of Holy Week, Monday Thursday, uh, when Peter is warming himself by the enemy's fire, and that little girl says, you are one of his disciples. Peter says, I don't know the man. She says, oh yeah, you know him. And she comes back, he denies again, and she says, you are one of his. Watch this, because your speech betrays you. Your accent. You are one of them fellas who hangs around him because you sound just like him. And beloved, if you and I claim to be Christians, when we open our mouth, something we say ought to sound like Jesus. Oh, God, I'm preaching better than anybody in here is saying amen. Would you look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, does your speech betray you on your job, in your conversation, when you're around people, when you open your mouth? Is there the accent of Christ coming from your mouth? We must, daughter, we must have her within us, within our verbiage, our language, our nomenclature. There must be within us the accent of the Galilean. And there are, I feel y'all going to sleep, wake up. There are, there are some words that belong to us, don't belong to the world. Y'all getting quiet on me. Um, Holiness is one of our words. Y'all getting quiet. Uh, mercy is one of our words. Quiet as it's kept. Love is one of our words. Hope is one of our words. Redemption is one of our words. Sanctification. I'm losing y'all like I'm speaking a foreign language. It's one of our words. 
And when the church stops using words like salvation and redemption and sanctification, we have lost the verbiage that belongs to the kingdom. The world talks of profit and bottom line, return on investment. That's the world's language. Our language is love and joy and peace and hope and redemption and salvation and sanctification. That's the language of the saint. And let me ask you, as I hasten on to my point, when was the last time any of those words were found on your lips? When, I do not mean to condemn you, but I do mean to convict you. When was the last time there fell from your lips the words uniquely ours that the world cannot use? Because the world has no authority or right to use them. The reason why I bring that up is because all this weekend, I have been introducing and inserting into the vocabulary and the verbiage of this church the word regeneration. It is, it is a purely spiritual word. And it is found in its context in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. All things, all habits, all lifestyle, all actions, all mindset are passed away and all things, not some, all things become new. It, it is this, we looked last week at the promise of regeneration. Felicia, this weekend I've been lifting, looking at the process of how we become new creatures. God does that through the process. Are y'all still awake? Yes. Tell your neighbor, say, stop snoring. Wake up. <laughs> I said, I said, I said to Minister Bobby and them this morning, there was a lady sitting over there at 8 o'clock. She was so sleep. <laughs> she, had, she had gotten comfortable. She was kind of turned to the side, had her arm here and her head and her arm. Ain't no, you know, no child, it's an old woman. She was I said, I wanted to stop and wake her up and said, did you say your prayers before you, because anybody sleeping that hard <laughs> should say their prayers before they go to sleep. I had a great sermon. She preached. She slept all the way through it. I want you to wake up. The process by which we experience becoming a new and better us. See, we've been shouting over the new room and the new carpet and the new tile and the new paint and the new da, 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 da. And if God wants to make us new, that's wonderful. But it doesn't mean anything if you don't embrace the process by which it happens. My Mary, I have told you about the butterfly and how the butterfly goes from caterpillar to butterfly in a process of metamorphosis. Right, right. That in that cocoon, there is a process by which that caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly from something rather ugly to something beautiful, from something clumsy to something graceful, from something slimy and slithering to something that is almost majestic in its wings and its pattern and its beauty. It is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't happen overnight. Right. 
There's a process. I told you that story that Dad Cray used to always tell about the little boy who found a cocoon with a caterpillar who had begun to turn into a butterfly. Finally, a few days later, there in the cocoon was a butterfly, and the butterfly was fluttering its wing, seeking to break through the cocoon. And finally, the little boy, feeling sorry for the butterfly, takes a pin knife, cuts the cocoon open, and the butterfly comes out, flaps its wings, and falls to the ground. Fully formed, but without strength. Because it's in the struggle. that the butterfly's wings become strong enough to fly. And God does not let us just fly without allowing us to go through the process that is often painful so that we become everything he wants us to be. Yeah. 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 Do you tap a neighbor say, neighbor, yeah. if you see me struggling, leave me be. Don't help me out. Because your help, oh God, I'm about to mess up here. And that's what's wrong with a lot of us. We've got the help when we didn't need it because the struggle was what God was using to make us what he wanted us to be. Is there anybody here, don't make me preach this hard and I haven't gotten to point one, but is there anybody here can look back over your life and shout right now that God didn't deliver you when you asked, but he left you in the struggle and you are better because of it. Y'all better leave me alone. Tell a neighbor, neighbor, it was painful while I was going through, but I'm better because of it. I'm stronger because of it. I can fly because of it. I can stand because of it. I can endure because of what I've been through. Slap five with a neighbor. Say, neighbor, if you see me struggling, leave me be. God may be making me. God may be shaping me. God may be forming me. Somebody holler, leave me be. It is, everybody say process. It is this process of regeneration. I do not have time to, to go through, to delve into all I've said Saturday night and this morning about the theological meaning of the word regeneration. That, that somebody said very quickly, very quickly, that regeneration is literally like in nature the return of spring where that which was cold and barren and dead and lifeless now springs forth with beauty. Another theologian said that regeneration is uh, that act similar to creation itself. When God stood out in the middle of nowhere on a platform of nothing and brooded, the spirit of God broods over creation. The earth was without form and void and Darkness was upon the face of the deep and God steps into that and out of chaos he brings cosmos. And regeneration is like unto that. This theologian says that God, I will, here's what he said that blew me away, that really our lives are like little worlds. Think of, think of the mess your world was in. Your little private world. How much mess and darkness and chaos and confusion and then came Christ. And he steps into that and brings order out of disorder Cosmos out of chaos brings peace out of confusion. That is regeneration. And so this weekend, Saturday night, we looked at how regeneration is the restoration when spring returns, the return of spring to the soul of a man or a woman, and God restores some things back to us. This morning at 8, we saw in a powerful way that this regeneration, this act, this work, this process of regeneration is likened unto the reemergence of things, much like when spring comes and flowers bloom and birds sing and there re-emerges in nature the beauty of the spring season. 
But not only is regeneration about restoration and restarting, not only is it about re-emergence and resurgence. I want to close today this three-part series on regeneration by suggesting that in regeneration, there is also a component of resurrection. Ooh, Jesus, I, if I have a quarter of a church, I'll preach this. Would you tell the neighbor, say, neighbor, God not only resurrects us, but he allows us to bring resurrection. Yeah, see, 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 once, once I'm alive, he then empowers me to go around and speak life to other people. God, I wish I had help up in here. So, so regeneration is not only about the restoration and the re-emergence, but in a wonderful way, it's about resurrection. Now, there are three things that happen in resurrection, and I'll, I'll close. The first thing in resurrection is the reappearing of what had disappeared. Um, John says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. But it does not yet appear. <laughs> I wish I had Bible readers. What we shall be, but we know <laughs> that when he shall appear, <laughs> we shall, do I have Bible readers, be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. It does not yet appear. Uh, in the same book of 2 Corinthians, Paul says that, that in this body, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our bodies that will come from heaven. That all of creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for the revelation of the children of God. Y'all are missing this. That, 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 that one of the things that regeneration does in resurrection, it is the reappearing of what had disappeared. Let me, show you if I, let me see if I can make you understand it. It is, it is uh, winter, winter, uh, no flowers, um, no roses, no chrysanthemums, no posies, no lilies, no lilacs. No, what's that one you like? Catalyl no catta lilies. None of that in the winter. But then... Spring comes. Yes. And there re-emerges yes. yes. through ground what's hardened. Yes. Buds of life. Yes. God, I feel like preaching this. That break through the soil. Yes. And what had disappeared in the winter yes. now reappears in the springtime. Who am I talking to today? Because there's someone in the room who is going through a winter season in your life and it looks like everything has disappeared. Your joy has disappeared. Your peace has disappeared. Your praise has disappeared. But I stood up today to announce to you that even though it's September, God can bring spring in September and what you thought had disappeared, he can make it appear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, would you look at a neighbor, say neighbor, I think I see something growing on you. Oh, I'm, don't make me do it, I'm tired. Look at a neighbor, say neighbor, I'm seeing a change in you. I, I see a smile. It's right at the crease of your lips. It isn't a full smile yet but you're not frowning as deep as you used to. I see the light coming back in your eyes. I see hope coming back. You got a better step. You're looking with more confidence. Is there anybody up in here who can shout that what you thought had disappeared, he is making it reappear.
Uh, Dwight, I want to say it, but I'm scared y'all are still. My sermon, tap a neighbor, say, I feel it coming back. No, that was the wrong neighbor. Get somebody who know what you're talking about. Say, I feel it coming back. I feel my laugh coming back. I feel my joy coming back. I feel my peace coming back. I feel hope coming back. And if I just hold on a little while longer, I feel my praise coming back. And I will bless the Lord at all times at his praise. Regeneration is the return of spring to the soul of a man or a woman, which allows for Sandra resurrection. Proof of resurrection is the reappearing of what had disappeared. When we, it is, it is, you'll excuse this, it is the eschatological hope of the believer. That 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 when 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 we when we roll them bodies down this aisle, stretch them out east and west in this building, and we eulogize them and celebrate them, and then roll them back out and put them in the hearse and take them to the cemetery and deposit them in the bosom of the earth. As Christians, we never say goodbye. Oh, no, oh, no. Don, Sylvia, both of y'all have buried your dad, your dad. Now, I need y'all to understand, when we drop them in the earth, yes, sir. Yes, we sir. look down in that ground, or we put them in the mausoleum, we look up at that vault, and we may shed a tear, but we do not say goodbye to them. We say good night to them, because absent from the body, is present with the Lord and there is coming a day when this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality and we shall be changed wish I had a church here, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we shall be like him they disappear for a moment but in resurrection, they reappear in a new body and a new life. And that is what Christ does for us in regeneration through resurrection. It is the reappearing of what had disappeared. The question we must raise, the relevant question in that text then becomes, why is there a need for the resurrection that produces this reappearing or revelation? Glad you asked. Because sin did three things to us. First of all, sin covered us. David says, so I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. I am covered with sin. Because I am covered with sin, my true self, I preached about this at eight, the reemergence of my true self is now concealed. So that while I'm living in sin, nobody ever meets the real me. Which is why some of y'all got married, then your spouse got saved, and it's like you met somebody new because you weren't married to the real them. Because the real them by sin has been concealed. But not only does sin cover me, are y'all still with me? Not only does sin cover me and conceal me, but sin by its very nature corrupts me. Therefore, I must be transformed. The metamorphosis of Romans 12, 1 and 2 which is what 2 Corinthians, the text for today, 517, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. And what had disappeared reappears. Here's this, are y'all still here? Here's the second thing. 
Resurrection in regeneration is the reviving of what was dormant. Now, now, beloved, this is one of the great mysteries of the faith. <sighs> Uncle George, pray for me in the next seven minutes because I got to work on something and I don't want y'all to go to sleep on it because it's going to be a little, a little weightier than what you may be comfortable with. This doctrine is one of the great teachings of, of, of the faith that though marred, stay with me, and scarred by the reality, the presence, and the practice of sin, there remains in us the root, the seed, even the essence of the imago Dei. The image of the divine. It is concealed, covered, and corrupted, but it's still there. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. So a crackhead still has Imago Day. A streetwalker still has Imago Day. A murderer still has Imago Day. Are y'all still with me? That even though I am marred and scarred by the presence and the practice and the power of sin in my life, there is still in me the root and the seed and the essence of the one who breathed into me the ruach, the breath of life that made me a living soul. Here, Renee, is where it gets deep. And all of that stuff, all of that God stuff, God likeness, God essence, God being is in me. But it's dormant. I'm walking around, Uncle Ro, with all that stuff in me. But like flowers in winter, they are still underground. Every plant you'll see in the spring is under the ground in the winter. It is just dormant. And this image of the div are y'all still here can y'all take this kind of preaching or do you want me to kick my leg and pull my ear somebody said that won't be too bad why don't you try that <laughs> now what is sad what is sad is that that image was dormant inactive inoperative and in many ways unresponsive which is why, beloved, Christ had to come to save us. There are three reasons why Jesus came to get us, <laughs> and you ought to be thankful that he did. A, he had to come get us because we had no strength. Paul refers to that. We were without strength. You think about it. Um, <laughs> you think about it. How many times you tried to stop? I told you about that guy who said, who said, Janet, he said, I can stop smoking anytime I want to. He said, I know, because I've done it 37 times. It ain't stopping, it's staying stopped. God has to come save us because we have no strength to stir up what's dormant in our lives. Here's the second reason, because we had no spiritual support. 
You see, when we are sinners, we are operating in the flesh. And we can only get what the flesh produces. That which is born, Jesus tells Nicodemus, John 3, that which is born of the flesh, because you only reproduce after your own kind. But then here's the third reason, see, it's because we had no source beyond ourselves. And he, he, here's the ugly truth about all of us. None of us could save ourselves. I get so scared when I listen to some of y'all testify. It makes me shudder. And then it makes me wonder, do you even understand what it means to be saved? You give yourself far too much credit. I've listened to you over the years, how you found the Lord, <laughs> how you gave your life to Jesus, how you came to Jesus, how you, and I listen and I think, my God, let them tell it Jesus did nothing. They did it all. When just the opposite is true, you did not find him, he found you. You did not come to him, he drew you to him. Can I preach in my own pulpit? Jesus says, no man comes to me unless the Father brings him. The Spirit draws him. You did not choose me. I chose you. Would you lift your hands and tell God, thank you. Because you and I didn't have enough sense to do it. We didn't have enough strength to do it. It is not of works that we have done, but according to his great love, wherein he loved us, that he has washed us in his blood. God had to come see about us. He had to. Oh, Jesus. God had to put on flesh. He had, he, had, he had executed the plan of salvation with bulls and doves and heifers and rams and goats and sheep. Offerings and burnt sacrifice. And heavens fills with smoke and the stench makes God sick. And finally God brings himself. Born of a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hell incarnate deity. He comes himself and does what we could never do on our own. What was dormant in you? You couldn't stir it up. Can I move on when I tell you this? And do you remember when you had flashes of it? Sometimes a song would come to you or a memory would come to you or a verse would come to you and you would feel it stirring but you had not the power to keep it alive. Sometimes you heard your mother singing or your father praying and they had been dead for years. Sometimes you heard the old saints testifying. Sometimes you heard them old praise songs or the snippet of a hymn and something in you would stir and you wanted to hold on to it, but you did not have the power. But that was the Spirit of God drawing you. God, I feel like preaching in here. That was the Holy Ghost wooing you. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I sought the Lord? Where is the soul's refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Return, O oh Holy Spirit. Return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sin that made thee grieve and drove thee from my breast. What do I do when I feel it? But I cannot hold it. It is then he does what we could not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that brings me to the third and final point. 
Because resurrection is not just that which was dormant and not just that which had disappeared. But we experience resurrection through regeneration when we are raised from the dead. Now look at y'all. Now keep in mind that this is a spiritual reality that ultimately results in a physical reality. But when God in Genesis told Adam to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said to him, the day you eat it, you will surely die. Now there are some theologians who argue that uh, that was a gradual process, that what God really meant was that eventually Adam would die. Nah. Nah. God is very explicit and very clear. The day. Let me try it again. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Which suggests to me, Sam Gresham, that God sees death as not just not breathing. What God says is there are some folk who are dead while they are alive. You see, we think that death is the cessation of life, the ceasing of breathing, inhaling, exhaling, the, our brain waves stopping, our heart ceasing to beat. Maybe to God, that ain't death at all. What he says to Adam is the day you do it, that's the day you die. And Adam lives hundreds of years later, but God's not a liar. So the relevant question of this point then becomes, what is death to God? And there are three things. First thing is death must be a life lived in sin. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, you hath he raised who were dead, wish I had Bible readers, in trespasses and sin. You were dead in sin. I will try that again. You were dead in sin. You were dead from sin. You were dead in sin. You were dead because of sin. And for God, Death is a life lived in sin. The second thing this must suggest then is that to God, death is a life lived in the self. Because he says, what fruit did we have in those days when we lived to our flesh or to ourselves? A person who lives in sin and lives to self, I don't care how much money they make, is dead. Their conscience is dead. Wow. Their spirit is dead. And beloved, may I ask you a question today? May I lift one query and raise one interrogative? What good is it to have your heart beating and your mind thinking and your spirit is dead? But then here's the third thing. Death for God is separation from him. Because what happens to Adam and Eve is God puts them out of the garden. And they are separated from God. And beloved, as I close, can I tell you, there is no fate worse than living your life separated from God. Now, I should have gotten a better shout than that because those of us who once were and are no longer ought to be giving God some crazy praise when we think about how he has reconciled us back to himself. I dare you to grab one neighbor by the hand, say neighbor, this next shout is not for my car. And this next praise is not for my house. My next praise is not for my clothes. 
and it's not for my job. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all, well, come on, Winston. Come on, Josh. I got a little bit in the tank. I might well run it out on the track. So let's go on to work. Tell a neighbor when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. My soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank you. Not for my car. Thank you. Not for my crib. Thank you. Not for my cash. But thank you for saving me. I was a wretch undone. But he looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Grandma used to sing, I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the water, he lifted me. Safe am I. And if anybody asks you, what's the matter with me? Tell them I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, and I got Jesus on my side, and I'm running for my life. He died until death died. He died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the moon dripped away in blood. He died until graves opened and dead folk walked over Jerusalem. He died until the veil in the temple was rent in twain. He died until the Roman centurion said, surely this must be the son of God. He died until the old account was settled. He died until it was well with my soul. He died until peace like a river attended my way. And I'm glad today that he did not stay dead. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future. Is worth living because he lives. Can I ask you one question? You know what I'm going to ask you. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Have you tried him? Do you know him? Have you trusted him? Has he made a way for you? Has he put food on your table? Money in your pocket? Gas in your car? Joy in your soul? Ain't he all right? Yeah! 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 Hallelujah! Yeah! Ain't he all right? Everybody stand and turn to a neighbor. Say, neighbor, 
I am so thankful for regeneration. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Regeneration is the return of spring to the soul of a man or woman. It is what happens in nature when spring returns. When what had disappeared, what was dormant and what was dead comes back to life. And in creation, in Genesis, the Spirit of God stoops and scoops and makes a man and God breathed the Ruach, the breath of God into the nostrils of man and man becomes a living soul. And in conversion, the second birth, the Spirit of God breathes Watch this. In creation, God breathed into man, breath, ruach. In the new birth, the Holy Spirit doesn't just breathe. The Holy Spirit enters. Y'all missed it. In creation, God breathed. Jesus breathes on the whole on the people and says receive the holy ghost on the mountain of trans he breathes into them but on pentecost the holy ghost doesn't he and we take him into us so we are filled with the spirit He regenerates us. He does it like God did creation when he broods over the chaos that's in the world without form and void. And our lives are little worlds that God in his spirit broods over until he forms us into the image of Christ become new creation.